How many receive that in the Lord? The Lord says days are coming. Powerful days are coming and perilous days are coming. Let me say that again. The Lord says powerful days are coming and perilous days are coming. We're truly coming into the great and awesome day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We're coming into unparalleled and unprecedented times, the Lord is saying. Amen. Hallelujah. How do you receive that in the Lord? And the Lord was speaking to me this morning and he was saying, Andrew, I'm beginning to draw my Gentile church into an understanding in the Hebrew like never before. Hallelujah. How many received that? Amen. Because our challenge in the Western church is we have a Greek mindset. Amen. But the Lord said the day is coming when ten men will lay hold of one Jew and they'll say to him, they'll ask him, are you going to the holy mountain to worship him? And they'll say yes, hallelujah, and they'll say let us teach you about our Jewish king. So this morning, I, I just got to tell you some things that God was speaking to me this morning. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So this morning, I was just enjoying the Lord, kind of minding my own business in Him. And it was why George was reading Psalm, was it 139 today, George? Yeah. Psalm 139, and I was just enjoying the Lord. And the Lord told me to do something through the Holy Spirit, something He wanted done this week. And how many know the Lord as we mature, as we grow up into our salvation, the Lord is teaching us not to brush off those little urges of the Holy Spirit, those little urgings of the Holy Spirit and think that was just me, but to really listen and know that Holy Spirit is speaking in ways all the time that we don't slow down to recognize and realize. Okay. So Holy Spirit told me to do something, and, and I said, yes, Lord. And immediately I felt a little bit of warfare going on in my spirit. So to me that was confirmation it was God. Because the enemy was fired up over what God told me to do. And I just kept saying to the Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Some of you might have saw me. George is reading, I'm just like this, right? And in my spirit I'm just going, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So the very first song comes on and we're singing Breakthrough, Breakthrough, Breakthrough. How many love that song? We're singing Breakthrough, Breakthrough, Breakthrough. And I remembered what God told me to do this week and I said, yes, Lord. And the Lord said, tell me yes in Hebrew. And I looked, pardon me, Lord? He said, tell me yes. I want you to say yes to that in Hebrew. And I'm thinking, he's never done that before. That's interesting. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll look that up after the service and, and, and I will, uh, you know, and, and I'll do that. And the Lord said, no, go in the back right now with your phone, get in the broom closet and look up the Hebrew word for yes. <laughs> and I said, okay, this just is so unique. It has to be the Lord. Because normally during praise and worship, I'm not going to go in a dark broom closet, you know, come off the prayer carpet and look up a word in Hebrew, right? So I looked up the word in the word yes in Hebrew and it's the word Ken, K-E-N. Isn't that interesting? But it's not pronounced Ken, it's pronounced Kien. Kien. That is yes in Hebrew. Isn't that interesting? So the Lord says he wants us to not only start saying yes, he wants us to say yes and speak his language. So I want to encourage you the next time the Lord tells you to do something, say Kien to him. Spelled K-E-N, but it's yes in Hebrew, Kien. And so I just came back to the prayer carpet. Sister Jean probably heard me because I was just saying it over and over to the Lord. I went, Kien, Kien, Kien. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And the Lord says in everything he's about to ask us to do, he wants our Kien, whether yes. we understand it or not. Yes. We sang a song during praise and worship. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Come on. And the Lord had me go to someone very specific and say, the Lord is singing this song to you right now. I'm not going to relent until I have every single bit of your heart. Hallelujah. And then we're going to go on the greatest journey we've ever been on together. <laughs> and it's the journey you've always wanted to go on. <laughs> so you haven't necessarily known how to get there. The Lord said, I'm going to take you on that journey. The Lord is saying from the remnant church at the end of the age, all I want from you is your key end. Yeah. And then we'll move together from there. And so I tell you, how many know the Lord says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. 
Even something as odd as leave the praise and worship carpet and go into a broom closet in the dark and look up a word on Google. How many know the Lord can Google? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. I heard of somebody the other day, the Lord spoke something to this person. And he said, Lord, what is that? I don't understand. The Lord said, Google it. <laughs> I can't make this up. How many know God can use anything? Amen. Right? Hallelujah. And I tell you, when we love him, and out of that love comes an obedience, yes. that obedience then bring forth, brings forth the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Because obedience brings the blessing when it's done out of love and not resentfully. Amen. Okay? So I'm thinking, okay, God, this is interesting, and, and I know this is what you're going to start having me say to you, key in from this point forward and not yes. I get it, Lord. But then God showed me something. As we began to go deep into the presence of the Lord, I was standing over here, um, and, and I looked over by the altar where the communion items are, and I saw Jesus walking amongst the seven golden candle stands. And they were burning. It was, it was the third heaven, and he was walking amongst the golden candle stands. And I just kind of watched in the spirit and enjoyed Jesus for a moment. And I saw his face. And the Lord told me this morning, there was people in this room that he wanted to look, wanted them to look upon his face. To stop looking around at everything that's so discouraging and start looking at his face. Because the Lord says, in my face is everything that you need to see. Did I not say that there's a generation that's going to kiss the face of the God of Jacob? And the Lord says, in that kiss is going to be a powerful release of my glory. Yes. If we will kiss the Son, hallelujah, we will see His glory come forth. That's why He said, kiss the Son, lest He be angry. Because the Lord now has a generation that's coming around Him that's not seeking His hand. They're seeking His face. They're not seeking the signs, wonders, and miracles, but they're seeking His face. And the Lord says to that generation that will gaze upon my face, nothing will be impossible to them. Many generations have sought my hand where there's healing and there's deliverance and there's restoration and there's prosperity and there's blessing. But the Lord says, I've been waiting for a generation that would seek my face. Amen. That would seek the face of the God of Jacob. Amen. How many received that in the Lord this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. How many can tell this is not going to be a normal word this morning? Amen. By the way, God's moving us out of the normal into the abnormal. He's moving us out of the comfortable into the uncomfortable. He's moving us out of the, the known into the unknown. God is moving us into a place where we've never been before. Amen. Every once in a while, he reminds me that as Joshua takes over for Moses, and how many know that there's a shift going on right now in the realm of the Spirit from the Moses generation to the Joshua generation? Joshua was a man of a different spirit. He would go into the tenant meeting with Moses. Moses would receive the word of the Lord and then he would go, go out as a great and friend of God and administrator and he would release the word. But Joshua was a man of a different spirit. He would stay in the tenant meeting until every bit of the presence of the Lord between the Moses generation and Joshua generation. How many have seen that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. The Lord is calling forth a generation that will linger in his presence. We talked about that Tuesday night. He's calling forth a generation that will linger, that will walk in the anointing of Joshua. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he says to that generation, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. And that's what the enemy is trying to do to that generation. He said, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I'm telling you, that generation is going places. Yes. The Lord has been having me read for the last two weeks in the book of Acts. The Lord said, I want you to read the book of Acts because I want you to understand what I did because it's the key to understanding what I'm about to do. So I've been reading in the book of Acts and he said, Andrew, greater works than what I did, you will do. He says, this house, to his remnant listening in right now in the broadcast, greater things than what I did, you will do. The Lord says, I'm waiting for a generation who will believe. I'm waiting for a generation who will believe that I am and I'm the rewarder of those who diligently seek me. The Lord is saying, I'm looking for a generation who will seek me beyond Sunday morning. And they'll allow me to be the Adonai, the Lord of their life. The Lord says, I'm looking for a generation that's been waiting for an outpouring of God. I'm waiting for a generation. I'm looking for a generation. My eye is going to and fro right now. My eye is going to and fro throughout the earth and I'm looking for those who have a heart for me. 
And the Lord says that generation will be limitless. The Lord said Mary was the forerunner of that generation. I gave her an impossible vision. And she stored these things up in her heart until she saw them manifest. The Lord said this is a generation that I'm speaking much over. And they're storing it in their hearts. But I'm about to open up the chambers of their hearts. And I'm about to bring that treasure out. And it's going to manifest in the impossible. Hallelujah. In the earth. The Lord says it's time. The Lord says it's time. The Lord says it's time. And the Lord says like John the Baptist, this generation is going to have to live differently than everybody else around them. The Lord said John the Baptist was my miracle, my spectacle. He was my unexpected one. He went forth, dressed different, lived different, ate different, spoke different. And the Lord said that's exactly what that generation was looking for. Something different beyond the religious structure of the temple. So I raised up a man that was so unique. And they were drawn to him, the Lord says. And millions came out into the wilderness to be baptized. But the Lord says his baptism was a baptism of repentance and water. The Lord said, I came forth with the Holy Spirit and fire. And the Lord says, we're transitioning from the generation, hallelujah, whoo, of water. And we're moving into the generation of fire. Yes. The fire of His glory and the glory of His fire. Hey! God says, I'm pouring that out over a generation. Amen. And I'm raising up a generation like no other. And they will be my spectacle upon the earth. And the Lord says in that generation as they go forth like John the Baptist looking different, acting different, dressing different, eating different, smelling different for they'll have the fragrance of Christ upon them. The Lord says as they go forth into the earth the Lord says the earth will awaken the earth will see that there's something different and they will be my witnesses, my martyrs throughout the earth and the Lord says they will be my forerunners that will bring forth the two witnesses at the the end of the age. Amen. 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 Ooh, hallelujah. Amen. The Lord says everything is about to change. Amen. I am releasing my forerunner anointing in the earth. Amen. The Lord says everything is about to change. The Lord for months has had me read to him out loud almost every single day. Joel chapter 2 starting in verse 28 and Amos 9 starting in verse 11. The Lord's talking revival, awakening, outpouring glory. The Lord is preparing a church to be a vessel that can contain his glory. That can pour out his glory wherever he wants his glory poured out. He's raising up a bride without spot and without wrinkle. He says the greatest generation is beginning to walk the earth. And they're going to walk and they're going to do greater things than what I did. The Lord said there's many things that I spoke in my earthly ministry that many didn't understand. But they're about to manifest in this generation. The Lord said there's things that I've unveiled from the New Testament church in the book of Acts that I'm about to reveal to this generation. The greatest light, the greatest revelation, the greatest outpouring, the greatest rhema. Ha! The greatest display of who I am is about to be poured out in the earth through this generation. The Lord said it will be a generation like no other. Hallelujah. I'm going to receive that in the Lord. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, let's just say it before the Lord right now. Kien. Just say Kien before the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's start a new culture in this house today. Oh, hallelujah. Instead of saying amen, which means let it be so, instead I'm going to say Kien. And if you agree, we're going to go from amen to key in. How many received that in the house today? Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we give you this word today. Lord, I can feel there's fire mixed with oil, mixed with glory in this word that you're releasing today. Lord, I'm feeling today that this is a word that you're releasing in this house. Holy Spirit, today we stand in agreement with you and we honor you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd release a living word in this house today. You've already begun. Lord, I thank you that you said, as you are, so are we in the earth. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that your church would raise up totally in love with you and begin to walk as you are in this earth. 
Lord, we're going from as you are, so we will be, to as you are, so we are, through intimacy with you. So, Lord, I thank you right now that everything is changing. Lord, I thank you right now everything is shifting. Lord, I thank you right now that we're not going to be able to go back to the way that it was. Because, God, you're bringing us into a divine, ordained Kairos moment in history. And everything is beginning to change. Lord, I feel an anointing on the word today that's going to move mountains. Lord, I feel an anointing on the word today that's going to bring a shift in people's lives. Lord, I feel an anointing on the word today that's going to begin to break strongholds. Lord, I feel an anointing on the word today that's going to bring a breakthrough. So, Lord, I thank you for your word releasing today. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord had me make a statement at the beginning of the word today, and don't expect a normal word. God really wants to release Rhema in this place. Yes. The Lord is so tired of men getting up and giving book reports. The Lord wants men to get up in the pulpit and women to get up in the pulpit and begin to speak out of intimacy and out of their intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. Enough of book reports. The Lord says, I'm tired of a generation that's always learning but never growing and perceiving and growing up into what I have for them. The Lord says, I'm calling you out of a place of receiving and into a place of doing what you've received. The Lord says everything is about to change. Anybody receive that? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God is calling His church out of the pew and into motion and action in Him Amen. as led by the Holy Spirit. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. So the Lord was saying at the very beginning of this word today that God is bringing His Greek church, His Gentile church into the Hebrew. And the Lord says in studying the Hebrew, we're going to begin to see things in the Lord that we've never seen before. Now, the Lord is not calling us to become Hasidic Jews. How many know we're Messianic? We believe the Lord Jesus is Messiah. He's Yeshua HaMashiach. And if we become just like Israel, how are we going to stir Israel to jealousy at the end of the age? We need to become like Jesus, not like the Jews. But the Lord says there's Rhema hidden in the Hebrew that he wants to begin to teach his people. How many receive that in the Lord? Hallelujah. So it's interesting that if we study the ancient Hebrew, the Hebrews had a name for God. How many know what the Hebrew name for God was as early as the book of Genesis? Yeah. Yahweh. 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 Elohim is another. I heard George just mention that. Amen. But one of the most common names is Yahweh. Yeah. And it's very interesting because God wants us to begin to understand that his glory is already being poured out and his glory is always around us whether we realize it or not. Yes. Okay? Well, Pastor, where are you getting that from? Psalm 19. I want you to see something that's interesting. Notice what the Word says in Psalm 19 and we'll stand up this morning to honor the first reading of the Word of God. Amen? Now the Word says this. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. So how many know if we walked outside the sanctuary right now and looked up, we're looking at the heavens. Yeah. And the Lord says they're already declaring my glory. How many know if the heavens are declaring the glory, the bride should be declaring the glory of Adonai, of the Lord. Is anybody hearing this? Yes. Okay. That's why all creation is waiting, it's yearning, it's growing for the sons of God to be revealed. God wants what the creation has been displaying for the Lord's earth to begin speaking and declaring and manifesting. Yes. Oh, I don't know if you heard that or not. Yes. If you heard that, say Kien. Kien. Yeah. Hallelujah, you're getting it. He said the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Isn't that interesting? The Lord says, the heavens declare who I am every day. Come on. Day after day, they pour forth their speech. And night after night, they display my knowledge. How do they display his knowledge at night? In the stars. How many know if you study the constellation, they tell the story of the gospel? Yes. Hallelujah. Astrology just took it and perverted it. We've got to understand this. So the Lord says, you know what? We have no excuse. 
We can't say I never heard the gospel when we stand before him. The Lord said every night that he stood, you, you got up and you looked at the stars like Abraham, you saw my gospel in the stars. He says there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Hallelujah. The word says their, their voice or their line goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Isn't that interesting? In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and it makes its circuit to the others. Nothing is hidden from his heat. Please be seated. How many know the time is coming where the Lord says nothing is going to be hidden from the outpouring of my glory? For the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. We are coming into unprecedented times in the Lord. So it's interesting that the Hebrews called the Lord Yahweh. Literally, they wouldn't even say Yahweh. And really, this is basically four Hebrew letters, right? Y-H-W or V-H, depending upon how that you look at it. And then we fill it in in order to be able to say Yahweh. But it's interesting, in Israel, they wouldn't even say Yahweh. They would just say the name. Because Yahweh was considered to be so sacred and so holy that the name shouldn't even be uttered from someone's lips. But that's Jewish tradition. Because we've got to understand the Messianic rabbis will teach this. They'll teach that our God is so awesome and so amazing that He created a way that every day people in the earth would say His name. Now this is interesting. And it's tied into how God created Adam. So how many know when God created Adam, the Lord took dust, elements of the earth, and he made a body out of it. But how many know there is no life in the body, but God then breathed life into Adam? Yes. How many know that? And we know the Holy Spirit is involved because Holy Spirit, well, the names for Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is Roha Kodesh, which means the breath of God. So what did God do with Adam? He breathed the Holy Spirit into him. But the rabbis teach, the messianic rabbis, this is how he did it. How many know if you're going to breathe a breath on somebody, you've got to breathe in first? Right? Okay? So expel all the breath from your lungs right now. Now try to breathe out. There's nothing left, right? So if God is breathing and we're made in the image of God, he's breathing in and he's breathing out. Okay? So the Messianic rabbis teach when he did that, he was speaking. What was he speaking? Catch this. Yahweh. Yahweh. Now they're declaring the name of the Lord. Yahweh. Is that not beautiful in the Lord? Hallelujah. It's also interesting if we take a look at that word Yahweh, it's actually made up of four letters in the Hebrew, yod Hey, wav or Vav, and then Hey. Now, how many have been enjoying the Hebrew studies? We've been doing a little bit on Tuesday nights. Yeah. Hasn't that been a lot of fun in the Lord? So we understand in the Hebrew, every letter has a number that's also assigned to it, and it has a picture assigned to it. It's very interesting that you see the triune God in the name Yahweh. This is fascinating. Because when you start breaking that, that name Yahweh or the letters apart, the first letter is Yod in the Hebrew, which is actually the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Interestingly enough, and that word Yod, this is fascinating. If we went to a an Hasidic or traditional rabbi and we asked that rabbi, describe Yod to me. Okay, Because in Hebrew, not only does every letter have a number assigned to it, it has a picture meaning to it. So they say, describe it to me. Because the Hebrew language is three to, this is really multi-dimensional. It's greater than three-dimensional, but that's a whole other message. 
But every, every letter has a number meaning attached to it, a picture meaning attached to it, and even a sound meaning attached to it. That's why the Psalms were set to music, interestingly enough. So this is fascinating. So the Lord gave this, brought this name forth for who he was to Israel, yod heh vav -Heh, And if we asked a traditional rabbi today, give us a picture of Yod, he would say the divine dot. The divine dot. And that's where we'd have to go, okay, um, we need you to give us a little more information. Because divine dot doesn't create a good word picture for me. So this is interesting. Then he would say the divine dot of light or energy that always was, always is, and always will be. So to someone who was Jewish, if you said Yod, someone who really understood, right, the word, the Torah, you said Yod, they'd think of the divine being of light that everything came from, the divine dot, they literally see God, the Father, as light. Now, how many know that's absolutely right on? Because if we go to John chapter 1, the word says he was the light that came into the world, but men rejected him because they loved the darkness and not the light. Isn't that interesting? So, it, so in this name of God, yod heh vav -Heh, the Yod is the divine dot or the light of God, and it's a picture of the Father, and another picture meaning of the word Yod is an outstretched arm and hand. Isn't that interesting? The outstretched arm and hand of light of God doing what? Creating everything that is. And also, they don't believe that when God created the earth, he stopped creating. They believe because an essence of who our God is is such a creative essence, he's always creating. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we need to get revelation on that one. Okay, we'll come back to that one in just a moment. So the next letter would be hey, or the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And it's very interesting when we look at that, it's a picture of a man with his arms raised in praise, in worship. Because our God is the light, we can lift up our hands in praise. How many know we can't do that if we believe that, that we came from an amoeba? They came out of a swamp. They grew a tail and then legs. Because our God is alive and light, we can lift up our hands. Can I hear an amen? But it's also interesting, though, that hey to the Hebrews is also a picture of the divine breath of God or the Holy Spirit. So are you ready for this? Yahweh. When we go, Yah, and breathe in the Yah, we're breathing in the light and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we breathe out the way, uh, who is the way? <laughs> the Lord Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. We breathe him in and then breathe him out as his bride. Anybody remember last week at the end of the service? At the end of our time of altar call, I just felt such a sweet presence of the Lord in the room, and I just said, breathe the Lord in. Anybody remember that? You know what we were doing? Yahweh is what we were doing, whether we realized it or not. And Josiah, I was talking to Josiah after that, and he said, you know what? I started breathing in real deep just before you said that. Why does that happen? I believe our spirit knows when the manifest presence of God is in the room. Now, how many know the manifest presence of God is always in us? Can I hear an amen? amen? Right? But how many know we can also sense when the manifest presence of God is in the room in a mighty way? Okay? And what becomes our first inclination, whether we realize it or not, to breathe in the manifest presence of God in the room? 
And then how many know what the manifest presence of God in the room that is, is in the room and we're breathing in the manifest presence of the God of God is the bride. It is now mixing with the manifest presence of God that's already in us. And then we're breathing out a dual anointing. We are breathing out a double-fold manifestation of the presence of God. Why? Because when the bride and bridegroom come together in unity, things begin to happen. How many know the word says one will send a thousand to flight, but two will send... How many are hearing this? See, this is important in the Lord. Now the third letter, yov he vav or wa, depending upon how you look at this, is the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it stands for tent or peg, interestingly enough. And the picture of this is heaven coming to earth. It's a picture of man dwelling with God. So if we really understand yod he vav he, the yod is God the Father, the he is the Holy Spirit, and the wa or the wa is the Lord Jesus. How do you receive that? Hallelujah. So the Lord disguises or within or contains within this name yod he vav he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling with man. Is anybody catching this? Light, breath, heaven, light. Well, who's on the end that's light? Us. Carriers of his light. Is anybody catching this? Because how many know from eternity past, the Lord Jesus longed for a bride... And the father longed for a family. Yeah. How many understood this? Yeah. So when we say yov he vav he or Yahweh, we're breathing him in and out, but it's also a picture of man and God, God and man dwelling together. And he said, and I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell amongst you. That's been the heart of God for, for, for all of eternity past. How many are understanding this? Yeah. Somebody, if you understand it, please say Kien. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many are enjoying the Lord this morning? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to understand that we see and we are around the glory of the Lord every single day, whether we realize it or not. And some of you heard me say this last Sunday night at Pelly Road. Do you know they've realized, if we, if we really begin to understand DNA, that in every strand of DNA, the entire Hebrew alphabet is contained in each strand of DNA inside of you. Why is that? Because the Lord, when he breathed into Adam, went, Yahweh. Isn't that interesting? The dirt that he fashioned as a body wasn't the life. His breath was the light that brought forth his DNA to manifest in Adam. Yes. Yes. Is anybody getting this? Yes. Now we've got to understand this. Now stay with me because this is important. You know what else the Hebrew rabbis would teach? They taught, they would teach that the Garden of Eden really wasn't on the earth. That's what they would teach. Okay. Why would they teach that? They believe that the Garden of Eden was somewhere between heaven and earth and that Adam and Eve had access to the garden but also had access into the earth. And when Adam sinned, God took away from them that access to the garden and they only had that access in the earthly realm. It was all they had access to. Adam lost several dimensions when he ate of the apple. Okay. Now that's going to make more sense in just a few moments, but this is very important to understand is this. The Lord wants to restore back to the church at the end of the age what Adam lost. Yes. We've got to understand this in the Lord. And I think he lost so much more than what we realize. Okay, 
Here's the thing. When Adam and Eve fell and they lost access, and I think this is a good word to it, they, for it, they lost access to the Garden of Eden. What did God put in front of the entrance to the Garden of Eden? Yeah, two cherubim with flaming sword. Did he not? Okay. By the way, how can two cherubim keep whatever it is out of a very large garden? Because doesn't the garden have multiple entrances? That's why they believe the garden was supernatural. That it was between heaven and earth. And all it would take would be two cherubim to guard the entrance to that. Now this is interesting. I just made the statement that God wants to give back to the end times church, the remnant church, what Adam lost. Amen? Yeah. So what was guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden after Adam fell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the curtain that Jesus tore. Yeah. The curtain that was rent, that separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies and only the high priest could go into Guess what they had embroidered on that curtain? Two cherubim. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of that whoo, when Jesus died, hallelujah, and he said, it is finished, and the curtain was rent, it was a picture, not only that we could enter into the Holy of Holies, but that we now had access to gain back what Adam lost. Oh, yeah. What the two cherubim were guarding, the Lord now made available to us once again. Amen. And what is the Garden of Eden a picture of? Intimacy with God. Because what did the Lord do every night in the Garden of Eden? He came and he fellowshiped with them and spent time with them. Do you know they lost that in its purest form when Adam ate of the apple? They lost that, the way that fellowship was. So what has the heart of Jesus been ever since? To get us back into the garden. Yes. To get us back into that intimate place with him. And everything God's about to do in your life is going to be accomplished through intimacy with Jesus. Everything. Is going to be accomplished through intimacy. And the Lord says, I am bringing a day, the day to the end where I will allow men to minister in the anointing and not out of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. The Lord said, I'm bringing the days to an end where I allow men to minister out of the anointing and not out of intimacy. Because how many know the anointing is without repentance? So there are people that are ministering in powerful anointings that are not walking in intimacy with Jesus the way they should. Amen. And it's caused a mess in the church. Yes. And the Lord said, I'm going to shut that anointing down until they fall on their knees and become humble and contrite and tremble at my word and cry out to me and pursue intimacy with me. Through that, it's going to come anointing like the earth has never known before. Yes. Didn't Jesus say greater things than what I did, you will do? Why was Jesus able to do amazing things, signs, wonders, and miracles? Why was he able to do things that, that denied the law of thermodynamics that were impossible? How was able, Jesus able to do these things? Well, he was God. Hold on. Hold on. This is where we need to start tearing the veil. Yes, he was, but he was son of God, son of man. He came and fulfilled both sides of the covenant. We've got to understand this. What was the problem with the old covenant? We can never measure up. We can never do it. That's why they had to keep bringing a lamb to sacrifice on the altar. Man could never live up to their side of the covenant. That's why the covenant that we live in now is a better covenant. Why? Because God himself wrapped himself in flesh. His own creation came as son of God and fulfilled the God side of the covenant and son of man and fulfilled man's side of the covenant. So in the new covenant, we just stand in what Jesus did for us. <laughs> what did Jesus say when he finished the work of the cross? He said, it is finished. Do you know what that really means in the Hebrew if you study it? It is finished. Do you know what he really said? I have accomplished my goal. Bride, come forth. Is what he really said. If you study in Hebrew what he said. He said, I've accomplished my goal. Bride, come forth. Yeah. And what happened after that? 
They put the spear in his side and blood and water flowed. Where does blood and water flow? At a birthing. The bride came forth from his side after he said, I've accomplished my goal, my task from the Father. Bride come forth. There was a birthing. The church came from his side, the second Adam, just as Eve came from the rib or the side of the first Adam in the garden. Yeah. See, we've got to understand this. See, the enemy wants to try to convince the church that we are not as supernatural as we are. Because if we could unzip the earth suit right now and you could, and we could see who you truly are, you are a being of light. Yes. What did Peter, James, and John see on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus showed them who he really was. And what did they see? Bright light, pure light, garment so bright that no bleaching of the earth could ever accomplish it. Jesus gave them a momentary glimpse of who he really was. And he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So he gave them a glimpse of who they really were. Yes. And what is the end times church going to do? They're going to walk so close to Jesus in intimacy that the earth suit is going to fall off. And they're going to become one with him, yes. and the glory of God is going to come forth. Yes. Now, Pastor, we're not going to shed our earth suits. I understand this. But what's going to happen is you're going to walk in such an anointing of the glory and a glorious anointing that the glory light of the Lord is going to begin breaking through this earth suit. Yes. Yes. And we're truly going to become the light of the world. Yes. The Lord said, No one takes a candle and hides it under a bushel or under a basket but unveils it for everyone to see so they can walk by the light the lord says through intimacy with me i am going to get the flesh out of the way come on so my people can walk in the spirit and be the light that i've called them to be but it's only going to happen through intimacy with the lord come on John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What words did God speak over you in the beginning? Mm -hmm. The Lord said, I want you to seek me in intimacy, and I'm going to tell you the words that I spoke over you in the beginning. Mm -hmm. The things I spoke over you as I was putting you in your mother's womb. When I saw your unformed body, the Lord said, I spoke things over you, and I want to begin to reveal to you the things that I spoke over you at that time, the things that you are becoming. The Lord said, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do I not decree it? Do I not declare it before I bring it forth? God, where are you doing the new thing? In you! Yeah. He's doing a new thing. Yes. And the Lord says, As you allow him to do that, that new thing through intimacy with him, God says then anything will be possible. The Lord says, as you allow me to do a new thing, then anything will become possible. Oh, is anybody hearing the word of the Lord? Is anybody hearing the word of the Lord? We've got to understand, things are going on in the earth right now that are unparalleled. The great and awesome or great and terrible day of the Lord has already started. How have you been paying attention to all the earthquakes going on? All the floods going on. All the twisters going on. Twisters going on during floods. Already weather patterns that are odd. And there's been a prophetic word that was spoken that this is going to be a very hot summer weather-wise throughout the earth. And that that is going to be a message that man has tried to mess with the weather, path, weather patterns and systems. But God is going to show that he is God and he's going to bring unprecedented heat in the earth as a picture of the fire that he's about to release on the earth. The fire of revival. The fire of revival will come before the fire of judgment then destroys the earth. See, we, we, we've got to understand what God is doing. So what's he doing in his church right now? He's growing her up in her salvation so that she becomes like Jesus so we can manifest Jesus to a lost and dying world because you can't manifest something you're not walking in. Mm -hmm. You are what you eat. Yes. <laughs> okay, hallelujah. Are we getting this? And I tell you right now, not only are we seeing things going on in the atmosphere, things going on in the earth we haven't seen before, science now has more detailed imagery and ways to look into things 
that they've never had before. And you know what's happening as a byproduct of that? Atheistic scientists are getting saved yes. at an unprecedented rate yes. because as they can look deeper into things, they're seeing the creative hand, yes. the yod of God in things all around them, fulfilling Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord in the earth. Ha ha! How many are catching this? Yeah. At the same time, the Lord is appearing to Muslims in dreams. And he's revealing to Muslims that he's not just prophet, he's prophet, priest, and king. Mm -hmm. yes. Come on. He's also revealing himself to Buddhists. Yeah. And he's showing the Buddhists who he are, who he is. And they're getting saved. He's even trying to reveal himself to the church. Amen. How many are receiving this? Amen. Well, why did you say that? Because the Muslims and the Buddhists are less resistant to him. Because he has to get through layers of religion when he tries to reveal himself to the church because when he reveals himself, the church just keeps on going, that's not you. That's not you. That's not you. You don't do that. You don't work like this. He's the God who put me in a broom closet this morning during praise and worship to look up the Hebrew word for yes. P.M. How do you know that he's about to show us things he's never shown us before? Jeremiah 33, 3. Call upon me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know. How do you know that those things that we don't know aren't going to make sense unless they're seen through the light of intimacy? Mm -hmm. Then those things will begin to make sense because the light exposes everything. Can I hear an amen? amen? But see, here's the thing. We've got to understand this and I want you to hear this this morning. The Lord is saying we're in an unparalleled time when he's releasing revelation that is drawing people to himself. All nations, tribes, and tongues are being drawn to him. Therefore, he's releasing more light and revelation over this generation than all of the others combined. I'm going to argue we're living in the most exciting generation that any other generation has ever lived. Oh, yeah. Because we're, we're seeing more light, more revelation, more glory of the Lord poured out in yes. this generation. The Lord is more tangible, more available, more visible to this generation than any other generation before. Because the veil is growing very thin and the Lord is looking for a generation that will press through the veil and kiss his face. What do you do at a wedding when the wedding, the I do's have been done and the rings are on the finger, the bridegroom lifts up the veil and he kisses his bride. The Lord says, I'm looking for a generation that will lift the veil off themselves and will kiss my face. Yeah. He's shaking the paradigms. <clears throat> He's shaking the paradigms. He's shaking the paradigms. And we need to understand this about the Lord. The Word of God grows line upon line and precept upon precept and it never stops Growing. The Word of God is still growing. The Word of God is still manifesting. Do you think He stopped creating when He said, Let there be light? His word is living and things that are living grow. His word is still growing. It's still expanding. It's still filling the earth. Why is the earth going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? Because the word of the Lord keeps growing and keeps expanding. Oh, is anybody getting this? Hey, now the Lord will never contradict his word with any revelation that you ever receive. Line upon line, precept upon precept. God will never contradict himself. If you've got a contradictive word, it's not from the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen. See, we've got to understand this. God has never stopped creating. Okay, well, well Pastor, what's he creating now? Other universes? Well, they are expanding. Scientific fact. God's creating things in you. He's creating things in you. And I don't know about you. I mean, I, I, I didn't come today for three songs and an offering and two songs and you're out at noon. Well, we already blew that. But um, <laughs> that's not why we're here. I'm here for Rama. I'm here to encounter the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen. I, I, and I'm glad you're here. I want you to see something. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 I want us to see some things today that if you really grab a hold of these things and let these things awaken, God's going to really begin to speak to you in a powerful way. How many want God to speak to you? 
If you do, just say in your own way to Holy Spirit right now, Holy Spirit, I just want to hear from you this morning. I just want to hear from you. Key in. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I want you to notice something here that's important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 25. How many are excited about the Lord? Okay. In fact, let's um, let's start in verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Let's talk about our Jesus even more. And the word says, then the end will come. How many know that we're moving towards that point rapidly? Yes. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Why is Jesus going to turn the kingdom that he's worked so hard to establish on the earth over to the Father? This is an important question we have to ask. He's going to do it because he wants to be with us. Is anybody catching this? He wants to be with us. Hallelujah. I will be your God. You will be my people and I will dwell amongst you. Do you know that when Jesus left the Father's side to be wrapped in flesh and to come and die on the cross for us, his relationship with the Father forever changed. And it was for our sake. And do you know what's going to happen at the end of eternity? Jesus is going to take everything that was placed under his feet by the Father and give it to the Father. Why? So the bride can be with the bridegroom for all of eternity. Yeah. Oh, that better touch your heart. Do you know what he's literally going to say? Father, all of this is amazing that you put at my feet. I just want to be with my bride. Oh. Oh. See, if we can get that really what he's been after all this time is intimacy with his bride, now the holy tumblers can begin to click in place and we can go, really? That was it? Yes. He said it in John 15. Abide. 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 You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go forth and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then he'll ask of the Father whatsoever you will in my name and he'll give it to you. What did he appoint you to? First and most importantly, to be his bride. Everything flows from the brideship. Everything flows from the wedding garment. Is anybody getting this? Oh, hallelujah. The word says in verse 25, for he must reign until. Does anybody have the word until in your Bible? See, this backs up what Holy Spirit was just speaking. He's never wrong. He will reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. When does the reign end? When he gives it to the Father. What's he do at that point? He just wants to be with his bride. Is anybody going, I don't know if I've ever quite seen that before. The greatest revelation, the greatest rhema is saved for the end times church. So you probably heard me say Sunday night that the the rabbis believe that in the Torah, every single word in the Torah has 70 layers of revelation attached to it. 70 layers of rhema. Anybody going, I guess I never quite saw this before. See, it's all about us. He did all this for us. Eden was about us. The earth was about us. He loves us. He loves us so much, he's going to put everything that he won, that he triumphed over, that's under his feet, he's going to give it to the Father. And he's going to say, I just want to be with my bride. Papa, you can administrate this. I just want to be with my bride. Is that not cool? The ladies are going, yeah. The guys are going, I'm trying to grab a hold of this. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's okay. Ladies, you can be sons. Guys, we can get a bride. Okay. But I want you to notice this. How are you enjoying the Lord today? Amen. Yeah. Let's enjoy Jesus from behind the pulpit. So I want you to notice what the Lord says. Verse 25, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Okay. What's the last enemy? Okay. Verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Hmm. For he has put everything under his feet. 
Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. Okay. So we understand the headship principle. Amen. We get that. I want you to understand this. And if you're going to get anything from this, well, get a lot of things from this message. But if you're going to get things from this message, make sure you get this, because this is crucially important for us to understand. Number one, in God's plan, Jesus takes everything that he gained the victory over and gives it to the Father because he wants to be with us. Okay? So the word would indicate there's still something that has to go underneath Jesus' feet yet. What is it? Death. Death is the last enemy to be put underneath his feet. I've got, I've got news for you. Jesus hates death. Yes. Let me clarify. Jesus hates spiritual death. Yes. What is spiritual death? Dying without knowing Jesus as Savior. That's what he hates. That's what he hates. Religion ranks right up there close to what he hates also like death. But anyway... Right, and religion is a form of death if you really study this, but stay, stay with me because this is so important in the Lord, okay? So the last enemy to be placed underneath his feet is death. Um, when, when, when does that happen? When does he place death under his feet? Because in his earthly ministry, he started taking authority over death before he ever went to the cross, didn't he? There was not a funeral that was safe if Jesus was within, you know, a 25-mile radius of it. In fact, in more than one instance, they're walking along and just happened to come upon a funeral possession. How many know they didn't just happen to come upon a funeral possession? Okay? The Lord Jesus was making a point to his enemy. And what was the point? I am the resurrection and I am the life. And Jesus walked into more than one funeral and raised a dead son. He walked into more than one house and raised a dead daughter. He called into more than one cave and called somebody out. Why? He was displaying the fact he already had authority over death. But it wasn't under his feet yet. And I want you to hold on to this because this is important for us to understand. Okay. Okay. Do you know that Jesus in his earthly ministry, and I preached on this a, a few years back, he even invited himself into the funeral of a Roman officer, which he should have been killed over. And that Roman officer, as part of the embalming process, had had his brain removed, if you study this. Okay? And the, so there, there's the sarcophagus, and there was this container with his brain in it based upon the Roman culture. And Jesus walked into this thing and raises this guy from the dead, a Gentile. It's in the Word. It was a picture that he was going to raise the Gentiles as much as he was going to raise the Jews. So we've got to understand this. So this is very important. If I can get you to this, this is, this is what we need to understand. The very last enemy that will be subdued is death. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Okay. How do we picture death as the church? We picture death as the church as somebody gets to the end of the book that God wrote about them, and they expire, and we have a homecoming service, and we put them in the ground, right? And some bright morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. <laughs> Do you know the author of life doesn't see death that way? Now, how many know everybody has to die? The word says it's appointed for a man once to die and then the judgment. Okay, but wait a minute now because there's a couple instances of folks in the word that didn't die. Okay, so how does that work? I believe the author of life looks at death differently than we do. We see expiration, coffin, service, funeral. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Lord sees it that way. Mm -hmm. Because my Bible says, I died with him. I was buried with him. And I rose with him. When is death truly going to be placed under Jesus' feet? When a, when a generation falls so much in love with him 
and is so full of revelation and his glory that they die to who they were so they can rise again in him and establish his kingdom here on earth is when death is placed under his feet. It's happening right now. If it's appointed for a man wants to die and then judgment, that means, okay, Jesus comes through the clouds and we have to die so that we can go up. Does that make sense to anybody? We've already died. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Do you know the last enemy is being, being placed under his feet? Active verb. Why? Because his people are learning to die so that he might live. And he's going to be so in love with that generation, he's going to say, Father, here's everything. I just want them. I just want my bride. Oh, come on. Come on now. See, I, I married Holly in this very building. Yes. I have an amazing wife. My wife said to me, Andrew, just give me a date and a time and I'll be there. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. She says, I got the dress. Give me the date and time and I'll be there. I said, okay, honey. So I designed the service. I wrote the vows. I did everything. Enjoyed every minute of it. And Holly showed up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want you to stay with me now. So we get married. I came down this aisle. We got married right here. Right in the middle of the service. We had praise and worship. And people waved raven flags. Yes. We had a hundred people in this building. Worshiping and praising Jesus. Amen. During our wedding ceremony. Yes. It's our highest hits, hit. We've ever, hit, our highest hit count. We've ever gotten on Facebook. Amen. It's our wedding. It's an anointed time in the Lord. But you know what? happen? Okay, now stay with me. I married her in front of the Lord and everybody. And then we feasted together. And then I said, you all are wonderful, but go home. <laughs> because I'm going to spend time with my bride. Yes. <laughs> That's going to happen at the end of the age. Thank you, Lord. See, we're all going to be gathered together. <laughs> married to Jesus. See, don't, don't wait to marry Jesus at the wedding feast of the Lamb. The wedding feast of the Lamb is the after celebration. Right. Marry Jesus here on earth. You die so that you can marry him. Yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay, grab a hold of that. We've got to fight dying. And we've got to surrender to Jesus so death can be placed under his feet. Yes. Death to our will, our flesh, our self, our desire, our wants. Because Jesus is at the end of the age is only going to move through a bride. Mm -hmm. He's only going to move through the bride. He's not going to move through folks that date him anymore. That's changing. So what happens at the end of the age? We step into eternity married to him and we celebrate with the Father, grab a hold of this, at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Okay? It's a whole other message. But then the Father, then the Son says to the Father, okay, Papa, here it is. I want to be with my bride. I finished the mission. We've walked out everything that we had planned. Here's everything that's under my feet. I want to walk arm in arm with my bride for the rest of eternity. If we can get that, how can we even believe one day in our life from this point forward that Jesus is ever distant, uncaring, unloving, doesn't hear us, isn't around? How can we ever believe that? That's one of the biggest fabricated lies of the enemy that we believed. Yes. Come on. How many are hearing this? Amen. And this is taking place in the remnant generation. Amen. Right now, the heavens are declaring the glory of the Lord. The bride's about to declare his glory on earth. Is anybody catching this? Yes. And you know, in the Word, we see two people that walk so closely with the Lord, He just took them. Mm -hmm. yeah. One was Enoch and the other was Elijah. Yes. Well, how could He just take them? They died and they got to the point where they were so in love with Him, He just took them. Yeah. How many want to be at that place in relationship with Jesus? Yeah. We're just so in love with Him. He just died so much. You become so much like Him. Jesus says, Father, we're going to call Him home now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I just gotta have him with me. I cannot wait to the wedding feast of the Lamb, Papa. I want this one with me right now where I am. Isn't that what he said in the garden that night? He said, Father, I, will, I wish they were with me right now. He said that in the garden. He didn't say that because he wanted to avoid the cross. He said that because he looked through the cross and it was going to open up the door to intimacy with him. How could he call, how could he call the cross joy for the joy that was set before him? The joy that was set before him was he looked through the cross and into, the, into eternity into the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's why when he said it is finished, he really said, I've accomplished the will of the Father. Bride, come forth! Is what he really said. Oh, is anybody getting excited about the Lord? So what's Jesus calling you to do right now? Two things. He's calling you to die. And he's calling you into kingdom life. That's what he's doing. What is, what is kingdom life? It's Matthew 6.33. Who can tell me what Matthew 6.33 says? Right. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. See, part of the challenge in the church right now is we've got our eyes looking parallel when they should be looking up. We should put our eyes on the bridegroom. The Lord was saying this morning, when they were all sick in the wilderness because of the sin that was going on, the Lord said, take a snake and put it on a pole, and anyone who looks upon the snake yes. will live. And the Lord said, in the same way, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Mm -hmm. So if the Son of Man was lifted up and you had to put your eyes on him, we need to stop keeping our eyes on this and get our eyes on this. Mm -hmm. Right? The prophetic storyline not the prevailing storyline. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? And God is calling a church that will do this. So here's the thing. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. What's all these things that will be added to you? Do you want to know the most important thing that will be added to you? intimate relationship with Jesus. You know what will come out of that intimate relationship with Jesus? You'll begin doing greater things than what he did. And then everything you need is provided in the process. See, part of the problem is we, we interpret the word through our earthly understanding. The Lord says, I want you to interpret the word through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus only spoke to his followers in, parallel, in parables. He spoke to his disciples yes. plainly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven are for the disciples, not the followers. Yes. Followers run away when the, when the shepherd is struck. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Disciples stay at their post. Oh, come on. And who was the disciple that was the one there at the foot? Who was the one that was there at the cross? Intimacy held him there. And intimacy with Jesus will hold you where knowledge won't. Oh, don't, don't, don't wander out of this message yet. Intimacy will keep you where knowledge won't. That's why at the end of the age, there's a lot of people that are very religious and can quote the word backwards and forwards. And when things start happening, they're going to quote the word up a storm. And then, many of them, their love will wax cold and they'll fall away. Why? Because intimacy will keep you where knowledge won't. Mm -hmm. And God is calling the church out of knowledge and into intimacy. That's why he spoke a few years back and he said, you've known the word of God. Now you're going to know the God of the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. He is beginning to speak to the church out of the Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. He's beginning to speak to the church out of the Song of Solomon. Yes. Kian? Yeah. That's why I'm so excited this morning. Cindy put in there the song from Song of Songs. Yeah. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. We talk about right the arm and all these things. That's right out of the Song of Songs. How many are hearing this? 
How many are hearing this? Okay. So if we understand what's going to be added to us in Matthew 6, 33 is intimacy with Jesus, then doing greater things than what he did and displaying his glory to the earth. How many know a lot's about to be added to us? Okay. Let it be unto you according to your faith. Let it be unto you according to your faith. So what's God doing right now? He's building our faith. And I'm here to help you with that. Thank you. And I'm going to be honest with you. Days are coming when I'm going to be darn right irritational. Thank you. I've been motivational. Now I'm going to become irritational. Amen. What does that mean? I'm going to start help, helping to nudge you. Yes. Into what you're called to do. This morning, I'm going to tell on one of my daughters. This morning, we're in the prayer circle. We're getting ready to wrap up. And the Lord said, have your daughter Sam close in prayer. I opened up my eyes. I broke protocol. You're supposed to have our eyes closed during prayer. Who taught us that? Anyway. Any, anyway. God's setting me free from the spirit of Southern Baptist. Hallelujah! Glory! I said, Sam, will you close us in prayer? And the look on her face was priceless. And then this precious daughter starts praying a very simple prayer that moved the heart of everybody in the prayer circle. Mm -hmm. yes. I should have just had her just pray that prayer and we'd have been done Thank at the very beginning. Yes. Because it was such a heartfelt, anointed prayer. Mm -hmm. And I think she understood after she prayed the prayer why I took her into a place that maybe she wasn't comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Guys, i got a word for you. God's about to take us into some uncomfortable places. Yeah. But they're going to push you and grow you up into what God has for you. Yes. Yes. Irritation can cause inspiration. Yes. And God's about to put the little speck in the clam for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But God's going to bring a pearl out of that. Oh, yeah. um, is anybody catching this? Mm -hmm. And if we truly understood what God was about to do, Nothing would be more important to us than Jesus. If we truly understood the way that heaven is going to meet earth, that Vav is going to meet earth, if we truly understood and how we're going to walk in the supernatural, we wouldn't hold on to anything right now. Right. We'd be like the men in the, in the boat when Jonah was on board. Let's just throw everything we can off this thing. Right? Because the ship is going down. You know what, guys? The ship is going down and the Lord says start throwing things off that don't matter. Because God wants to immerse his bride in him. Is anybody catching this? And right now, there's some people in the earth walking in the supernatural in a powerful, 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 powerful way. And are having encounters with God all the time. But it's happening through intimacy. Intimacy will take you where knowledge won't. So we've got to understand that. So there, there's an apostle. This is a true story that lives in Alaska. He's got an Alaskan apostle. Hallelujah. So his wife had cancer. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed for her. And she didn't get her healing. And they got to the point where something had to be done. So he took her from Alaska down to Mexico to get some treatment down in Mexico. Now, let's not judge his actions, okay? But let's talk about what God did. So down in Mexico, she was able to get treatment, and God actually used that, and she had a complete recovery from cancer. Praise God. They drove from Alaska to Mexico. Wow. So they traversed the continental United States. So on their way back, she says to him, and she's feeling terrific now. Let's stop by and see our daughter on the way home to Alaska. Kind of on the way, she lived in Las Vegas. <laughs> so they drive from Mexico to Las Vegas, show up at the daughter's house. The daughter grew up in church, loving Jesus, but got into her adult years and walked away and struggled with whether God really existed anymore or not. How many know sometime in your walk with Jesus you'll go through a crisis of faith? Yes. Intimacy will hold you where knowledge can't. Right. 
That's why it's so important that we just invest in intimacy with Jesus right now because what's coming? How can Matthew 24 happen? How can people turn on each other and fathers turn in sons and mothers, daughters and all this and love grow cold and all this? How can this happen? Lack of intimacy with Jesus in the church. Yes. Knowledge without intimacy. That's how Matthew 24 happens. Is anybody catching this? It was a mystery to me until Jesus started talking about intimacy. And I went, oh. What holds a marriage together when things are tough all around it? Intimacy. Are you catching this? So the apostle gets his wife in the car and they head up to, uh, <laughs> up to Las Vegas and they start praying the whole way. Lord, touch her daughter. Lord, touch her daughter. Lord, touch her daughter. So they get to the daughter's condo. They're hanging out. They realize they want to get a couple of things for dinner. So the dad takes the daughter, leaves the, the mom there, and they go to the local Walmart. Can you imagine what Walmart is like just off the Las Vegas Strip? That has got to be a pretty wild place. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So he walks in, the apostle walks in with his daughter into the parking lot and they go to go in the building and there's a lady standing out there and she's begging for money. This is a true story. She's begging for money. And she, they go to walk past her and she says, sir, can you give me some money? He walks past and then the Holy Spirit convicts him and he stops. And Holy Spirit said, hand her $500 because I want to bless her. Now, how many know after they traveled to Mexico, been down to Mexico, and are now heading home, money on the way back from vacation is not as plentiful as money going on vacation? <laughs> Everybody get that? Okay. So he stops, has his, takes his daughter's hand, and says, come with me, pulls $500 out of his wallet and gives it to her, and says, I give you $500 in the name of Jesus. And they turn to walk away, and pandemonium breaks out. People are screaming, yelling, crying, going nuts. And they turn back around to figure out or to find out, as someone told him the story, the moment he said to her, I give you $500 in the name of Jesus, and they turned to walk away, she disappeared. She was an angel. And people all around saw her disappear. And that guy got to share the gospel with all kinds of people and they got saved. And God started touching that daughter's heart. Isn't that interesting? So they go to, after they've been praying over people and things are, he's been praying over people and things have been happening, daughter's just watching. Watch a guy comes up to her and says, hey, I'm a taxi driver. Can I, um, can I take you guys home when you're done? Because they had evidently taxied in. And he said, sure, sure. So they get their stuff. They come out. The guy's waiting for them in the pickup zone. They get in the taxi, takes them back to the condo. They get out, and the daughter says, don't forget to pay the taxi driver. He pulls the money out, and the taxi disappears. <laughs> Along with the driver. That was an angelic escort back to the condo. How many know that's biblical? We entertain angels unaware. By the way, that's the way this apostle lives all the time in the supernatural. Yeah. How many times are you going into Walmart and somebody's asking for money and that could be an angel? Yes. How many times are supernatural things going on around us that we never ever right. realize? Mm -hmm. I went into Walmart one time right up here on Alpine and you know there's the two entrances and I drove past that quick little entrance not to the gas station entrance mm -hmm. but as I was coming around I noticed a guy holding a sign. Mm -hmm. Bearded guy Looked like he was homeless. We'll work for food. And so um, I, uh, I I made a middle notes and I said, you know, Lord, if that guy's still there, when I come back around, I'll go through that entrance and I'll give him some money. So I get my stuff. I get in the truck. I look up and there he is. So true story. So I drive around and I go up that little hill, right? You can only go right mm -hmm. to go up that hill to, to go up on Alpine. And I roll the window down because he's over on the passenger side. And I said, you know, I just bless you in the name of Jesus. And I gave him the money. And he looks at me, and it was a moment where it felt like the entire earth stood still. And he looked at me, and he didn't say thank you. He didn't say God bless you like you normally hear or something like that. He looks at me, and he goes, Yeshua is coming back soon. 
Wow. And I said, Lord, if he disappears, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this. I said, Lord, I got mountain moving faith. But if this man disappears, and by the way, when I, came, when I rolled up on him and looked at him, he had brown eyes. When he looks at me and he says, Yeshua is coming back soon, his eyes were crystal blue. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. And so I just <laughs> looked at I couldn't say a word. And for me to be speechless, wow, that's something. You all know me. For me to be speechless, I, you know, I've always got a word for anything, right? So I just kind of nodded. And I rolled up the window and I moved out of there. And by the time I got to the top entrance, going past it, I looked back, he was gone. Mm -hmm. This guy was gone. Now, it could have been a guy, it could have been an angel. But I've never felt the earth stood still, stand still like that before, other than in some services where the presence of God just comes in, in undeniable ways. Um, it was absolutely incredible in the Lord. How do you know that's some people's reality? Pastor Cindy, can you give us Genesis 5.24, please? Yeah, have you got just a little bit left yet? Mm -hmm. You got a little more you can absorb? Is that okay? Yeah. We're not going to get through this whole word. You're going to come back. have to come back next week for the rest of the story. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I want you to see this. Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more. <laughs> Why? Because God took him away. Law of first mention. This is the first person in the Bible, Genesis 5, that God takes. Isn't that interesting? I'm not talking about dying. The word didn't say, and Enoch died. The word says, and God took him away. Mm -hmm. Do you know what this tells me? There's a point that we can get in intimacy with the Lord where the Lord just says, I want you with me now where I am. Mm -hmm. There's a place like that. And do you know what we need to be working towards? The place where he says that. <laughs> now, as I say that, I don't know how my wife feels about that. You know what I'm saying? But how many know, even though I love my wife, and I want to be married to her the rest of my life, and I will be in the name of Jesus, <laughs> because she's my gift from God. She's my Ruth. I'm her Boaz. Oh. Amen? Yeah. Oh. Her, true, or her true husband... Is Jesus. Yes. My true marriage partner is Jesus. And the goal is to fall so in love with him, be so intimate with him, to just die to everything, to where he lives and manifests through us, that he just says, okay, you're coming home. You're coming home. And that's what God did with Enoch. But here's the thing. God does that with Enoch in the old covenant, and our new covenant has better promises. So if Enoch could do it in the Old Covenant, how much more in the dispensation of grace yes. is this available? If David could press into intimacy with Jesus in the Old Covenant, how much more available is intimacy with Jesus to us today? Yes. What do we need to do? We need to take it. Yes. Let me ask you a question. How many years did Enoch walk with God? Yes. Do you know Enoch didn't start walking with God until he was 65? If you study scriptures, he didn't start walking with God until he was 65. Do you know how old he was when God took him? 365. So we, we read this. We see Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God and was no more. And we see this whirlwind romance that happened very quickly and poosh, he was gone. Folks, you know, that's ABC Soapbox Theater on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> he walked intimately with God for 300 years. Which means what? He manifested God on the earth for 300 years. Seventh generation from Adam. Do you know Adam was still alive when Enoch was on the earth? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you know what happened one day? I just got an odd feeling, and this is just my thoughts. That at 65 years of age, he even thought to himself, I'm missing something. Just something, something's missing in my life. I want to go talk to a great, 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 great grandpa. Because great, 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 great grandpa walked with God 
in the garden. Mm -hmm. And Enoch walked with God. Is anybody catching this? And I believe he went to Adam and said, Adam, great, 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 great grandpa, what was it like? Well, what was what was what like? Eating of the apple, seeing the snake? I don't even care about that. What was it like walking with God? And I believe as Adam described it, Enoch's heart became like the heart of the two on the road to Emmaus. Yes. Did not our hearts burn within us as he explained the scriptures to us? I believe something began to unlock in Enoch. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. What does seven represent in the Hebrew? Completion. It took seven generations to get to the place where someone said, what Adam had, I want. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he met with great, 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 great grandpa regularly in this journey, in the journey to intimacy with God. But then it got to the point where he became so lost in God, so intimate with God, the Lord said, okay, come with me. Actually, he said, come with me because God had a multi-generational mission for him, I believe. How many know that there's three people in the Word that didn't taste of death? One was Enoch. Who was the other one? Elijah. Elijah. How many witnesses show up in the book of Revelation? Two. Two. Who's the third? You. Because you're not going to taste of death either. Because you're dying so that Christ might live. And you're going to manifest his glory here on earth. And death as we know it will have no authority over. Hallelujah. I'm speaking that over you this day. Hallelujah. How many know God's about to change everything? Yes, yes. You know what's interesting? Who was the eighth from Adam? Years. And out of that relationship comes Methuselah. Methuselah lives 969 years. Methuselah's name's name means after he dies, it will come. Or it will come after him. He was the eighth generation. He was the final generation before the flood. Yes. Eight in the Hebrew is the number of new beginnings. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Enoch, seventh generation, walks with God. Completion. Methuselah, the eighth generation, eight the number of new beginnings, is going to usher in God's judgment. The flood didn't come until after Methuselah died. Just after he died, then the flood came. Let me ask you a question. Why did Enoch live 365 years and Methuselah 969 years? Because Methuselah was a picture of God's grace. God modeled intimacy and relationship with him through Enoch to mankind. And he gave them the lifetime of Methuselah to see that, repent, and walk with him. He desires that all men would be saved and come into a knowledge of the truth. <laughs> Methuselah is a picture of God's grace. Grab a hold of this. We are walking in the dispensation of Methuselah right now. As in the days of Noah is what we're living in. Why has Jesus not come back yet? Two reasons. The church has not truly become his bride without spot and without wrinkle yet. Secondly, he wants everyone to possibly, anyone that could be saved, he is in his grace allowing this time for his bride, his fire bride, to get out there and get the gospel to them that they're living and walking out so that as many as possible can be saved before he returns. Is anybody catching this? There's angels in this room right now. I can sense there's angels in this room. There's a scribe angel in this room taking notes. So you're not the only one taking notes. This is a message that God wants to be a turning point for some people that are hearing this word. Some people in this room and some people that are listening in. God wants this to be a turning point to you. And he wants to get your attention and let you know things are not just going to keep hopping, skipping, and jumping like they always have. And then you can just wait until you get older to say to the Lord, Kian, yes, Lord. 
The Lord says the time is short and we don't have time like we have in previous years to say when I'm this age, when I've done this, when I get married, when this happens, when I accomplish this, when the kids are out of the house, then I'm going to go after you with all your heart. The Lord says we've got to go after him right now. He says, Behold, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to bless you and prosper you, not to harm you, to give, a, give you hope and a future. Okay, you know this. Then you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Today, God is putting the invitation out there. He's saying, I know what I've got for you. Now I want you to take that revelation and seek me with all your heart because I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will set you free from your captivity and I will use you in ways that you never thought that I could. How many know that's Jeremiah 29, 11, 12, and 13? How many receive that in the Lord? Anybody enjoying this word? Is anybody enjoying this word? Okay. Guys, we need to understand something. Revival, revival fire is beginning to burn. All you need to do right now is Google the college and high school campuses where revival fire is breaking out and the list is growing weekly. It's a sign that Jesus is coming back soon. Now I want you to hear this because this is important. This is a word from the Lord. He didn't give me this word, but I wanted to read this for the group because this is incredible. The Lord says, every previous revival and awakening up to this point has been a seed that's gone into the ground to bring the greatest fruit of the last and greatest end times revival. Okay, let me say this again. The Lord says every previous revival and awakening has been seed that's gone into the ground. What did Jesus say? Unless a seed goes into the ground and how many know that's a picture of dying in Christ? And the hard outer shell breaks away. See, God wants to break the hard outer shell that's around you right now. I'm saved! Yeah, but you need to be broken. That's for all of us and myself. Okay, I'm saved, I am saved, and I'm being saved. I'm broken, I am being broken, and I will be broken. It's a process. How many know in every new season the Lord takes you into, there's an element of brokenness in that season? We've got to understand this. We've got to stop thinking that, that this is something we're going to look in the mirror and we've arrived one day. This is a journey. This is a process that we're in. We've got to keep moving forward through intimacy with Him. Wow. Anybody get this? The Lord says every revival that we've had up to this point has been a seed that's gone into the ground. It's run its course. Hebrides, Azusa Street, Toronto, Brownsville, the great Welsh revival. Yeah. We could go on and on and on and on and on. They went into the ground and died. Why? Because they had run their course and they now were going to bring forth the greatest fruit. The Lord put it this way also. The Lord said every revival that has hit the earth up to this point has been like a man going to the faucet, turning it a little bit, and just a few drips have come out. The Lord said in the last and great end times revival where I fulfilled Joel chapter 2 and Amos chapter 9, he said, I'm going to open up the spigot full blast. That's the revival that we're coming into. Okay. Let's use the forest fire principle. Forest fires, forest, firefighters understand in the forest, especially in the, the higher regions and the mountains, when there's a fire... You don't want to start. You don't want to start spraying things parallel. You want to look up because there's probably a big tree, and the top of that tree is on fire. And you can put out fires down below it all day long, but that big tree that's on fire at the top is shooting out mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. little fires that are catching all around. And you got to get to the top of that tree. Sometimes they have to cut it down. Yeah. The Lord says, "I want you to be my oak of righteousness." standing mighty in the forest of humanity and I want you to be set ablaze and through that blaze I want to be able to start revival fire throughout the earth and wherever you go. 
and you will be a mighty oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Isaiah 61. How are you going to be an oak of righteousness? Oh, hallelujah, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. God says, I want you to be my fire bride. So intimate with me, so on fire with me, that everywhere you go, fires break out. Or you can settle for lukewarmness. And I'll spit you out of my mouth at the end of the age. Mm -hmm. That's our Jesus. That passionate lover who's going to say to the Father, you know, Father, all this is wonderful, but I give it to you so I can be with my bride, is the same Jesus with eyes of fire, hair like wool, and feet like bronze, who will say to people, depart from me, I never knew you. That's the same Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we've got to understand that about him. And we've got to just shed this thing. He's love, he's love, he's love. Well, he is, but he's also fire. He's the mercy seat, but he's also the righteous judge. He's the lamb of God, but he's also the lion. And the Lord is saying right now, if you will pursue me with all your heart, if you'll pursue intimacy with me, you're going to eat of the whole lamb. When Israel comes up out of Egypt, first Passover, the Lord says, eat the whole lamb. And that was a picture of deliverance. The Lord said, right now, if you'll eat of the whole lamb, I'm going to deliver you Amen. from every stronghold, from every hindrance, from every generational curse, from every mindset, from every temptation, every addiction. The Lord said, if you'll pursue me in this hour, because right now the heaven is open, if you'll pursue me in this hour and go after me with all your heart, I will deliver you, says the Lord. I will be found by you. I will set you free, and I'll make you my fire bride. The Lord said, or you can pick religion, lukewarmness, and keep going on like nothing is ever going to happen. But the Lord said, mark my anointed words. The door of the ark will close. Mm -hmm. And when it closes, it closes. Mm -hmm. If we truly believe that, we're going to have a sense of urgency about our own life and walk with Jesus. And we're going to have a love for the lost like never before. Yeah. Because the thing is, the more you love someone, the more you become like someone. So I realize uh, as long as I've known Holly and we've been married, in some ways she's become like me and in some ways I've become like her. Mm -hmm. That's part of love. Part of the goal of marriage is that you, you know, become like the best part of the other person. Right? And we grow and we learn through that. That's the goal. That's why some married couples, by the time they've been married 50 years, they start looking like each other. Yeah. Yes. Very true. That's true. Yes. Because you look like what you behold. Mm -hmm. You become what you behold. Yeah. What will happen when a generation does that with Jesus? Right. See, and I know Holly now to the point where I know what she likes and I know what she, she doesn't like. <coughs> I know if I take her to a Chinese restaurant and she walks away to go to the restroom and the waiter comes up, that she's going to want hot and sour soup. I know that she's going to want sweet and sour chicken, but she wants them to cook the vegetables a little bit more than they normally do because she doesn't like them to be overly soft. She likes them to be nice and crispy. She wants to make sure that she has plenty of sauce, right? I want. I know she's going to want to make sure that her, her drink is there, her teacup is full, she's ready to go. Yeah, they're key in. They're going to give him his yes. But also when things happen around them that grieve Jesus' heart, they're not going to go, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. No, they're going to go, you know what? This grieves the heart of my God. And I can't participate in this. You know, they believe that Timothy died because at the end of his life, he was in a city and they had a parade that was going on. And in this parade... All kinds of things were going on that grieved the heart of God. Mm -hmm. And he ran right in front of that thing and started crying out for mm -hmm. repentance. Mm -hmm. And he died in the process. Mm -hmm. See, what's going to happen is when we totally fall in love with Jesus, we're going to love what he loves and hate what he hates. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to love the sinner. We're going to hate mm -hmm. the sinner. Mm -hmm. And because we hate sin, we're not going to tolerate it in our own lives. Mm -hmm. First, then we're going to have an issue with it. What does the word say about Lot? And every day his spirit was vexed over what he saw going on around him. Now, it wasn't vexed enough that he left. 
Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's vexed. God says, as you fall in love with me, you're going to love what I love and hate what I hate to the point where the things that are going on around you, you aren't going to tolerate anymore, and you're going to become part of the answer. And you're going to release my power and my glory. You're going to release my love, my way. You're going to be a picture of me. And then, to some, you're going to be the fragrance of life. And to others, the stench of death. Who is worthy of such a calling? Guys, I'm telling you, intimate people with Jesus are not going to be able to keep it hidden much longer. This year, and he said this year in China, the underground church will come above ground. God is making the low places high and the high places low. And the hidden things he's bringing to the surface, both that that's of him and not of him. Oh, is anybody hearing this word? Okay. The Lord said that he's not going to have me speak anymore. You're going to get the rest of the word next week. There's just a lot the Lord wanted to speak today outside of the notes. Isn't that wonderful? I love it when he speaks outside the notes. That's so neat in the Lord, isn't it? So the Lord said this is a word that he released today to get us to respond. And if we can hear this word today and we can walk out of this place unchanged, unchallenged, unwilling, there's a problem. And it's not with the Lord. It's with us. It's with us. God took this word to places today I didn't expect him to take this word to. Hallelujah. Amen. And he even convicted me with things that were spoken today. I love it when God does that. How many know that those he loves, he disciplines, and those he loves, he doesn't let us stay the same. Right? Because the goal is to become like him. So we're going to turn the lights out. And I'm going to ask Cindy to put on um, Glory to the Lamb. And we're just going to take a couple minutes. And if the Lord spoke to you, I don't think it's a matter of if he spoke to us. I think it's a matter of how are you going to respond to what the Lord just spoke. Okay? I want to encourage you right now, respond to what he's been speaking to you. You can stay in your chair. You can go up to the altar. You can get on the carpet. You can get on your knees where you are. You can get in the aisle. But I want to encourage you to respond to what the Lord just spoke. While you're doing that, and right along with that flow, I want to encourage you to prepare your heart to take communion. So the word says that we should not take communion lightly. But that before we take communion, we need to get our hearts right with the Lord. We need to confess unconfessed sin that's in our lives from the last time that we took communion, that we are to repent. In the Greek and Hebrew, repentance meant a changing of mindset or a changing of direction. It means not only do I, Lord, I, I just repent of that. I'm sorry, God, I just confess this before you. But I turn around and I go the opposite direction from that thing. So as Cindy puts on the song this morning or afternoon, I'm just going to give you a couple moments. And let's get ready to just respond to the Lord regarding this word today. And to take communion. What a terrific message to set up communion today. Hallelujah. 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 So, there's something in this room that the Lord is saying, I've been waiting. I have intimacy in store for you with me like you've never imagined. I've just been waiting. He says, I'm waiting for you. Come to me. Draw near to me. And I'll draw near to you. So I want to encourage you. Let's just take a couple minutes and talk to him.